Good morning to all our audience. And once again, Belinda Pinotti, USEC representative for the markets of uh, Honduras, Paraguay, uh, Venezuela, Colombia, the name of the US Soy Export Council. I welcome you. First of all, I would like to extend a warm uh, greeting to our uh, brethren in Colombia uh, with the serious situation they're undergoing. We have had two sessions offered uh, throughout uh, Tuesday and Wednesday um, covering uh, topics on uh, strengthening the feed industry and the future of animal protein. Today, in the third session, we will talk about strategic actions for uh, the industry. Uh, this time, Strategic Action for Industry Associations, we have two excellent presenters who are Pablo Tortorella and Vinita Gupta. We will have the uh, Q&A session will be moderated by Dr. Laura Scully from Andy Colombia, and we will end the agenda with a short presentation in closing uh, by Fred Bellin Escarraman, a uh, country rep for USEC, who will talk to us about sustainability. So we're going to um, give the floor to engineer Pablo Tortorella. He is an agile coach at CLEAR, uh, which he founded in 2011. His first um, project using uh, Agile Frameworks was in 2006 when he was uh, developing software in Buenos Aires. Since then, he has applied different tech Agile uh, techniques and methodologies in different um, environments, both in software and in other environments. He was a university uh, teacher um, for 10 years on topics around oh. Agile tech. Agile approaches apply to technology. He has, um, in his company, Clear um, consults with different companies around the region. His title, his talk is called "What is Strategic Agility?" Paul, it's a pleasure to have you here. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Belinda. Thank you to the audience. Here, I've been uh, connect, connected from Medellin, Colombia. Thank you for your uh, words. Uh, uh, regarding this situation, I want to share, uh, based on my experience and my knowledge, the things I things I know that will give you results, because this isn't a fashion. You start to hear about Agile in different uh, business magazines, in different um, academic and uh, business environments, and it might be... Uh, confused with a simple fashion trend, but Agile has existed since before the 1990s and it started to be structured and organized and uh, disseminated since that time. And if it's just a trend, it's a very long lasting trend. So I'm going to start with what it is not. Let's start by discarding things. Agile is not a methodology. Our methodology is a detailed step-by-step -step process that we'll follow. It's a recipe. And in the case of Agile, we have a lot of techniques that will allow us that we could bring into bring values and principles in a day-to-day. -day it has uh, good or bad. If, if good would have been if Agile was so good, if it had a recipe, we could just be able to follow it and that's it, uh, success, right? But on the other hand, the positive thing is that each uh, company, each organization, it can adapt in a different way to each company and organization. What is it not? Um, agility is almost immediately associated with speed. Um, and I would like to make this distinction very, very quickly, because um, if you want to take Agile to your company, um, this doesn't mean that it, you're going to be able to uh, make your employees work faster. But there is, uh, Agile does make a promise of delivering um, value uh, early, um, quickly and in a timely manner. So there is a component of speed in comparison to other working techniques where, for example, in a traditional project, you could take six months or several years 
uh, to have an initial deliverable that starts to generate a return on investment after all that time in an agile environment, in an uh, agile project, in an agile company, those results appear uh, earlier, but not as a consequence of rushing, not as a consequence of um, hurrying. Um, it's not multitasking. We have the false belief that we are very good doing a lot of things at the same at the same time. Um, we have we read sentences here and there. We hear it in different uh, social and environmental environments. We say I'm very good when I um, do things a lot uh, a lot of things at one time. Um, there's also the belief that women are better about asking than men, um, but I constantly uh, sample students at the, comp at the companies where I work with, and the amount of time lost for changing from one context to another is 25 to 30%. We lose three months of our year, if we look at it from that point of view, changing from one subject to another. When we measure it in a uh, activity that... Um, it takes a short amount of time. Uh, 25 or 30% is a lot less than three months. But let's not work on a lot of things uh, in parallel. If I'm uh, taking a call and also trying to fill out a report, uh, it's better if I finish the call, then I write the email, and then I uh, write the report. Uh, Agile is it about, let's just do these three things, please. Um, on the contrary, prioritizing is um is agile so what is it if it, it it's adaptability it's a capacity it's a personal and interpersonal capacity it's an organizational capacity that can be acquired that can be worked on and that implies inspecting and adapting that leads us to uh what organizations want the most uh which is their survival so if we're in um boom situation in our business that's the time to start thinking about what we need to do when that boom ends and if we're uh, undergoing difficult times then agile also works or helps us because it's the uh, last one we have to adapt our business and our ways of working and it's a path you can't say i wasn't agile and now that i'm agile or when i'm agile it's not an arrival. It's not a university degree. I'm an engineer, as Belinda was saying. And after having uh, finished my studies, uh, passed my exams, and graduating, I became an engineer. But with Agile, we can't say that. It's, it's more like health. You could always make decisions to become to, to be in a healthier situation. So with health, you could eat better, you could exercise, or you could rest better. And like these three examples, there are uh, many ways to be more healthy, to have a more healthy life. With Agile, it's exactly the same. It's a path, it's a road, and we can always be more Agile. Today, you are being, and I am being Agile, a certain extent and so uh, tomorrow after making certain decisions we can become more agile it's possible that when you uh, start down this path you you won't want to leave it um is this is just kind of an um, amuse bush for something that you might want to uh, learn in greater detail and it's a mindset this mindset is the mindset of the people who focus and who add value, who work uh, collaboratively. And to know um, that they're providing value, they compare the product and they compare what they're doing with the feedback that the company and the clients give them. And if they don't get that feedback, they go out and look for feedback. And the topic of focus is also important. I was mentioning this earlier in the area of prioritization. It's not the same to be uh, working on three things than on one. So I work in collaboration when I know that I'm better doing a certain task individually, then that's okay. I could do that individually. I tell my team that I'm going to do 
uh, this thing on my own, but I'm going to set aside the time to show my team what I did to get feedback, to offer help, to ask for help, to do that work better. It's also a way of doing. So I was saying there's no uh, recipe to be agile, but if you uh, experiment and learn using small steps, then you're being agile. It's a way of doing. I have an idea and I say, oh, why did I take it into this segment that I never offered them this product, this segment? Well, I'm going to do a test that many of you might think, for example, a survey. Let's uh, apply a survey. That survey? If I do it for instead of doing it with 10, 1,000 or 10,000 people, let's apply it to one person. Uh, let's talk to one person about that survey. They're going to give us uh, their feedback. The second, third pe person that I uh, survey, they will have a better uh, set of questions and then I can evolve it. And when I can scale, and then I can scale it up and take that survey or that uh, manner of testing to more people, I will do it. And so experimentation and using small steps, validating or refuting uh, lessons learned is a large part of that uh, mindset of agility. And it's also a way of being. It's a way in which we help each other. We care for each other. We improve our environment and our surroundings. We practice our um, awareness. I've separated what Agile is and what Agile is not. I want to bring these down a bit more down to earth so you could take away a more practical idea of how to be Agile. But first I want to uh, quote the sources. The quote, the, the source of Agile are from 20 years ago, no, more, no less. 17 experts sat down for three days to work on four volumes that they uh, wrote down as the Agile Manifesto for uh, software development and 12 principles that complement them. So we have four values which are written here, individuals and interactions uh, above processes and tools, software uh, working above extensive documentation, customer collaboration over and above uh, contractual negotiation and response to change over and above uh, following a plan. So I talk about uh, delivering value, uh, um, improved uh, response to change, inspect and adapt. And all of the principles of the Agile Manifesto um, are based on the way of working or motivation uh, or technical excellence or stopping the ball to get feedback. So what if those 17 authors uh, summarized uh, in 2015 uh, and called it the heart of Agile? And these are four words that instead of being written as values and uh, principles are written the M Imperative, it's collaborate, deliver, reflect, and improve. Collaborate, deliver, reflect, and improve. And therein lies the essence of what we were uh, seeing in the values and the principles. I'm going to um, look at ways that we can break these words down to earth. And in clear, my company, we complement th this. Um, Phrase, let's collaborate to deliver value and reflect to improve with another phrase, which is let's experiment to evolve. Regarding collaboration, I'm going to go very quickly through each concept. Let's create a common purpose. It, we can't just uh, communicate and declare it. Let's um, open space for emerging leadership. People can make an impact. Um, within environments of power generated every day. Let's um, offer and ask for help. Uh, let's not just uh, contribute uh, from our role. It's, our purpose is not to that our role wins, it's that our team wins, it's that our company wins, and that users receive our products. Let's create common spaces for multidisciplinary teams and listen to diverse voices. 
let's generate and create spaces for focus, given giving our team clear objectives, which will motivate them. Let's make our vulnerabilities visible. None of us are perfect. Are perfect. All of us have our virtues and our de defects. Let's make them visible. In the team, we need to create a space for uh, conversations on vulnerability. And finally, let's uh, practice and work on uh, genuine trust. When we contract with a supplier, when we work with our people, let's uh, not and use penalty clauses. Let's uh, say, um, what are we going to do? How are we going to settle in the case of a conflict? Uh, we can't say, oh, the hole is on your side of the ship. If there's a hole, then we're all going to go down and we need to solve it. Um, and delivery, let's um, discover who we're working for. Who is my customer? This will, um, the Harvard Business Review um, published on article of 30 elements of value for clients that are still very, very true today. Um, what do we prioritize? What do we pay attention to? And that's what's going to grow and flourish. Um, and frequently and continuously, let's uh, use, we always try to do 20% of the effort that provides us with 80% of value and then move down to the next 20%. Um, many times trying to cover the whole scope is a is a loss of time. Let's do 20% to bring it out to the market, bring it out to the market and test it. Uh, we could also use user story mapping and always, 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 let's try to get feedback, ongoing feedback, um, early feedback and timely feedback. Reflection is one of the fundamental cornerstones of Agile. And that's why um, we give it the space in the talk. Let's ask ourselves not only what am I building, but how am I building? It's very, it's very common that uh, steering committees review the results of the company, but why don't they also look at its way of working? The way it works is completely undervalued. Let's work and reflect. Let's um, reflect frequently on what we did well, not only what we did badly, because what we did well will also help us take it into other areas of the company, into other projects, other people. What do I need to change, both as a company and as a professional? Let's stop to uh, sharpen the axe. Um, when you're a uh, woodcutter, this is um, evident, uh, but in our daily work as a company, it's not so evident when the ax goes dull. Entropy occurs in every area of life. So let's stop the ball to see how we can improve our work environment. Let's give time to silence. Not all meetings have to be um, loud. We could uh, write down on post-its, on uh, sticky notes, or on digital screens, uh, how we're viewing our uh, work at this gives introverts the uh, possibility to contribute uh, to meetings where they may not feel comfortable speaking. And let's also work individually and, co and collectively. And improvement is a consequence of reflection, getting outside of complaints, thinking about small steps. We can say, let's do this thing we're thinking about next week. And if it works, then we can replicate it. Um, let's experiment to validate learning. Let's only look at the things that are necessary so that measurements don't become an obstacle. And let's improve not only products, but also our processes. Not as an exception, but every day. Every day, a small improvement. And for that kind of, um, let's create a safe environment for making mistakes if we uh, penalize um, mistakes that we won't open the door for to mistakes. I have four questions for you. Co-created plans and our own objectives are key for maximum motivation and productivity. Do you design your plans with your teams and your objectives? Or are the directors the only one that do this? Do products go out of the market early? Do they receive more feedback and more timely? Do your products go out into the market only once they're perfect or do you put them out earlier? Um, 
team uh, reflections uh, are times to stop producing. It sounds bad, right? To uh, reflect and talk about how we work. How frequently do you do something like this at your organization? Experimentation provides validated learning. How safe is your context for designing experiments, learning, validations, or refutations early and uh, pivoting? Pivoting means changing direction. How safe is your environment? And finally, I already mentioned that agile is a path. Please tell me, maybe I use the chat, what will be your next step um, to become a little bit more agile. Thank you very much. And I'm open for questions. Thank you very much, Pablo. The Q&A will uh, be uh, during the Q&A session after the second talk. Okay, Pablo, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. Uh, we're we have very good uh, time. This is important information on Agile, but the thing I liked the best was that you have uh, publicly recognized that women are better. Yes, I love you very much. Thank you. Okay, so let's uh, remind the audience that you can uh, enter your uh, questions at the Q&A widget um, located beside the chat widget. Okay, so let's continue with uh, today's program. Now we're going to have Dr. Vinita Gupta, um, who will present the topic strategic planning for industry associations. Vinita is a physician, a lawyer, and an expert in organizational development. She has run um, global programs to strengthen industry associations and uh, building community platforms for accountability and commitment. Vinity uh, consults on the topic of associations, uh, strengthening professional associations and um, capacity development, including strategy, sustainability, and fundraising. Vinita was co-author of several um, outreach and capacity building uh, publications. She has held workshops on many different uh, topics and has been invited to uh, talk at over 60 universities in the United States and Europe. She has an ample coverage in uh, printed, online, and broadcast media around the world. Benita, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, hello, everybody. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Although we have a brief time together, but we hope to cover some of the broad areas to catalyze your thinking. To make it um, interactive, I'm sure you already know it, but please familiarize with your uh, thumbs up, thumbs down, and a raise hand feature. We might have a question or two to engage you. Um, our objectives for this presentation, we um, will still stay on the first slide, please. Thank you. Um, our objectives for this presentation are to deepen the understanding of strategic planning for professional associations, to discuss the individual components of a plan, and then what's the outline the process and discuss the post planning process. What do you do after it is done and some tips to keep it dynamic. So those are the kind of objectives we, uh, we hope to get through this presentation. So the first question, as you'll see in the slide, is who are the professional associations? What is unique about them? What is different from NGOs? So one um, unique feature that professional associations have is a membership. They have a membership uh, of a specific job, specific industry, trade, like yours, um, it might be SOYA. So they, they have a specific member of an uh, industry or a trade. And one of the most uh, important activity they hold, like this one we are in, is to hold events for their members, whether it's for networking or facilitation opportunities or uh, development um, areas for their, uh, for their industry or the uh, associations. And what is unique about the strategic plan? Like strategy is like strategic plan is everybody needs to have it. I have it for myself. So, um, so what is unique about the professional associations uh, strategy plan? 
So one of the thing is that they address the key and the greatest concerns of the membership. So what are the membership's uh, uh, aspirations or fears or risks? So it addresses those key concerns and where they want to go as a membership of that trade or that uh, field. And they may or may not have a philanthropic objective or a social cause attached in their mission. Um, the source usually comes from the membership. Uh, they may have corporate social responsibility. They may have grants and um, in-kind support from the members. So these are kind of the sources that the professional association would generally have. And as you know, we have seen it in the COVID times that trade and industry is affected by many factors. And it, 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 during the COVID, we all knew and learned that the health security issues can upend everything. It has affected every aspect of our life, including our trade, whether it's connected to health directly or not. So, Having the professional associations um, look at that risk mitigation, how do we uh, prepare ourselves for any such eventuality is also part of the professional association's mission and goals. <clears throat> Every entity has to adapt to challenging context and environment, um, but is affected differently. So any professional association because it's focused usually on one trade or industry. So it will look at from that perspective, what are the changes in technology? What are the changes in uh, trade or markets that are constantly changing and affects the opportunities, economic opportunities and growth of its members? So the professional association of that trade or industry will look at that more specifically. Um, continuous uh, learning opportunities for its members like this one. And it was such a great talk uh, before about agility. So those kind of opportunities um, professional associations provide. Um, most of the PAs, uh, professional associations, through its strategy plan, aspires to bridge the present and the future, where their trade wants to go, where their members want to go. So that's some of the key differences. So now we come to why, why create or refresh a strategy plan? And I'm assuming that most of you uh, belong to a professional association that has a strategy plan. Doesn't matter how extensive it is, how um, uh, developed or how basic it is, but I'm assuming that. And um, please give us a thumbs up or a thumbs down if that assumption is correct. Um, so why do we create or we refresh? If you have it, then keep the refresh in mind as I go through the steps. Strategic planning process uh, is used to determine what the professional association should accomplish, which direction they want to go, what strategies would help them get uh, to their goals, how to mobilize resources to fund the activities of the professional associations. As we talked before, there are different sources of uh, uh, resources for the professional association. So strategy plan would talk about that. A make big picture plan for the future of an industry or a membership or how to influence the uh, policies or that affect their industry. What is their goal for growth? Um, the role of PA in community. Sometimes the professional uh, associations have a goal in the community they, they function uh, to add to the social uh, life of that, um, that community, social philanthropic programs. The factor influencing all these goals and focus areas and objectives change, and so should the strategy. And we kind of talked in agility a little bit before, so it's very, very important that we, we remain dynamic and forward thinking and contemporize our strategy plan as we go forward. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now, step one is how do we get started on refreshing or crafting a strategy plan? And so although um, it's very important to understand the context and harness the information from 360 angles, right, from our members, from our customers, from the environment, for the policymakers who affect our trade or industry. So it's very important to harness the information from the 360 angle. But the most important thing is the commitment of 
or I should say one of the most important thing is the commitment of the leadership that's central to refreshing or creating a strategy plan. And also not just creating, but it's usefulness, that it's not sitting as a document, but it's actually a living document. And the implementation is done successfully. So commitment, so building the commitment, there are various ways the commitment of the leadership can be build. We may not be able to go in detail, but I'm happy to answer any questions if they come up. So then next is the putting team together, right? So I, having done a lot of work with professional associations, which were like five member to thousands of members organizations, it comes up. The smaller uh, P is more than the larger ones. They're like, we don't have a team. Who does it? But believe me, there are creative ways to create a team, even within a very small professional association with the least amount of resources. But it is important to creatively think about allocating, depending upon the size of the professional association, thinking about how many people we need in the team. Few from staff, few from membership, few from board. So getting them together and putting a team together is the next step. And again, I want to remind everybody, even if you have a, a strategy uh, already, your plan, strategic plan, and if you're refreshing, the steps are the same, but you just approach it a little different. Then is plotting the timeline. So having a timeline helps. Uh, when are we putting a team together? When are we having a meeting? When we come up with a draft? When we hold um, uh, refreshment sessions? And when do we uh, uh, start implementing? How do we implement it? What time we measure it? What time we come and adapt um, the stra uh, our plan from the learning? So those kind of things, we need to plot it as a timeline. Convening and learning. Now, this is a broad set of things, right? So first we talked about also 360 learning. So that will come here, convening focus groups, convening your customers, convening your membership, convening your staff. So all those convenings happen and then you tease out the information from it to see, okay, what did we learn? Where are we today? Where our industry might go? Sort of SWOT analysis comes out of it as a part of analysis of those um, convenings and learnings uh, process. And then um, the thing with uh, analysis is that I tend to think it more simplicitically, simplicitically, even if it's a big organization. There are few questions that we have to answer during this process, one way or the other. We can, we can format it differently, we can have a different approach, but it's who, what, why, so what, and then comes how. So what I mean by that, who are we uh, serving? What are we trying to accomplish? Why we are trying to accomplish? What will happen if we accomplish that? And then how do we do that? How we accomplish that? So these are few factors uh, that we need to address during our uh, strategy. Slide, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so once we have that, now I'm going to more refresh, assuming that you all have your um, strategy plans, uh, whichever form they are. Um, and if you don't have them, then creating mission and vision would be the first step. And um, it will come through the convenings and information harnessing you had, and then um, the analysis you did. You can use different ways of analysis, but those are the questions we are answering. You can use SWOT or, or other format or frameworks. Um, then drafting the goals and objectives. And then we go to the strategies. So it's answering the same question, who, why, so what, and how. So strategies and tactics would fall into how. How do we um, accomplish our missions and goal uh, mission through setting up the objectives. And one thing I'm often asked is, is it important to measure it? Yes, it's very, very important that we, um, through our strategy, we create a space of laying out how we are going to measure, how we are going to evaluate 
uh, against the goals we set in the in the strategy plan and how we're going to learn whether we met them we overachieved or we underachieved what are we learning and how we are adopt, adapting do we need a course correction so all these things would come out of that uh, next slide please so drafting a plan. So there are some key factors, and we discussed in our third um, in the slide before that we have the components of a plan is mission, vision, goals, objectives, strategies, tactics, and um, and then Emily, the measuring, evaluation, and learning. So these are the um, uh, components of a strategy uh, strategic plan that we should have. Uh, then filling out, I, I usually um, recommend having an outline first and very basic bullet point sort of outline under those sections and then start to build out. But, and that's a, that's a level where we can um, have an outline and get our stakeholders input before we go too forward. So in the timeline we talked about before, we should build those things like how do we how do we seek input from different stakeholders? At what time we are seeking? At the outline level, and then at the final draft, and at the final, and then reviewing. So we draft the plan, and a graphic modeling of the plan really helps visualizing. It helps um, uh, different sort of uh, stakeholders learn quickly who might not uh, read the plan or might not have an, um, uh, availability of the plan because it could be an internal document and certain portions are made um, external, uh, externally available. So having a graphic modeling helps your stakeholders very um, easily understand what you stand for, where you are going. And then engaging the stakeholders. At different levels, we talked about how do we engage the stakeholders, the information collection, the SWOT analysis, um, review of the plan as we develop it, and then also in refreshing. Uh, so there are different ways we can engage stakeholders in development of strategic plan, and then also in the implementation of the plan. And then they're adopting the plan. So once the plan is final, it really helps to uh, have a formal adopt uh, adaptation uh, step for the plan. And it, it starts with usually with the board and then it goes um, uh, to the larger circle and the larger circle to your membership and then your bigger stakeholders that could be your customers. Certain portions will go to them for adoption of the plan. Slide six, please. Now we talk about um, some of the components, the sub plans that we uh, might want to have. So this is very often I've seen uh, overlooked area in the strategic plan, right? So we have a great strategic plan, but that's where it ends. For the implementation and for the successful um, uh, strategic plan, it's important to have staffing built in into it, right? How do we build the organizational capacity? So if we are looking at a growth path, for our professional association or our industry or our larger market. There needs to be an organizational capacity that runs through it, right? So that plan should include in how we are viewing each year our growth and how we are going to match that growth with building our own organizational capacity. I have seen it many times, big organization, global professional organizations that build out the programs, but their staffing may not build accordingly, or their organizational capacity may not build accordingly to the growth of the programs. And that's where they start to cave in. So having that in mind is very, very useful. Communications uh, sub plan is also very important to market um, your professional association, uh, where you are lending up in terms of your growth, marketing that, creating um, demand. All those things should be part of the communications plan. Funding, how are you going to fund your um, 
your strategic plan uh, implementation. Uh, how are you going to? So most of likely, professional associations have membership fee, uh, events, uh, sponsorships, some grants. Especially in times of the COVID nineteen, there had been a lot of opportunities. Uh, although the situation is so unfortunate, but there are uh, state led or philanthropic led or private led opportunities to fund that. Uh, professional associations. So having a plan helps refresh it and take the advantage of those opportunities. And then sustainability. Often, again, very often overlooked the area of a strategic plan is how are we going to make professional association itself sustainable along with the other component of your trade and membership sustainability. Uh, next slide, please. So we come to the last one. And uh, the, here is that, what did Charles Darwin, the father of science of evolution said that applies here? It's not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but the most responsive to change. And that applies so much to the professional association, not only for the sake of uh, the trade, where it's going, adapting, to the technology changes, to the health security risk that we are facing right now. How do we adapt? How fast we respond? How fast we um, mitigate risk mitigation? That all these components make a huge difference on the survival of the, of the trade itself, of the growth of the membership, and also for a professional association itself. What does that need? It needs periodic review. It needs staying relevant. It needs cultivating ownership. So these things are very much needed to keep your strategy plan alive, thriving, and achieving the goals that it's set to uh, achieve. Thank you so much. And I hope you ask me questions. Thank you very much, Vanita, for your excellent presentation. Yes, we all need to be prepared for change. So we're going to have a lot of questions and answers. And so we're going to move into the Q&A session now. Um, the Q&A session will be um, moderated by Laura Pasquale. She has is specializes in, uh, in sanitary and phytosanitary uh, measures, and she has negotiated on, on this in FTA um, with the U.S., with Korea, and other companies. She has worked as a consultant in different companies, uh, companies like Colombia, Conex, uh, ECLAC, Sedavi, uh, Colombia, uh, the National Planning Department. She has coordinated uh, programs and projects like MIDAS with USAID and the it, in the Inter-American Assistance. Um, she has also worked as in the Aviva. She was a university teacher in Colombia and Ecuador. She is the author and co-author of um, of different publications, she currently works at the Andy. Um, go ahead, You're, the floor is yours for your question and answer session. Okay, good morning to you all. Thank you, Yusik, for this invitation to share the space with you all and for all the support we've had from you all, especially due to the condition that we're facing right now in the country that we're expecting to find a fast solution for the well-being of all the protein industry. Because, you know, we work for um, feeding the Colombian population. Today, our speakers have uh, given us uh, very important ideas. I wanted to highlight from Pablo, more specifically from, this, from the situation where we're at, that agility strategy that leave the, leads us to adapt to change. It's a very important call 
because we need to create value on a day-to-day -day basis and, uh, and we need to have fast questions. And then from Vineta, obviously associations have something that brings us all together and we need to keep our focus in terms of growth and in terms of keep on advancing and creating the capacity within our associates and within our organizations in order to offer those services that we so much need. I wanted to start with Pablo asking him a question of what's the right moment? Should there be ideal conditions for us to develop a strategy or this agility strategies you speak about? Well, th thank you, Laura, for your comments about our talk. The right moment is right now. I believe that when we think, when should we be agile? We should be agile since now. So one of the, uh, of the triggering questions said, how, how often do you stop the organization to reflect? If you don't stop, if you don't stop producing, think in those industries that require of lots of practice in order to go onto the market, uh, high performance sports, for example, music, sportsmen and women, they train every single day. That doesn't give them a profit. The magical moment is the moment of the game or that day of the competition or the week of the competition. The same thing happens with the musicians uh, with uh, uh, with the fast car, fast car drivers, the musicians play and play and play on their rooms, in their rooms by themselves. But the concert, or when they record that label, is, is those moments when they can come out and show to the, the public the results. Why don't we learn from those industries and give us ourselves that time to practice of introspection, of working our way of working. And I'm not saying that we should take four days of reflection and one day of production, but that's not the idea. It's not just going to extremes. But from the same week, what if you all and you invite your collaborators to invest on one hour a week, or if that's too much, one hour every 50 days, just to reflect. In your work groups, you could start just by there. And I just like share that possibility for us to say, what do I need to begin? Not much, just taking that decision. Pablo, and what would be that first step that organizations should take in order to start implementing that agility strategy? Well, there's many possible first steps. Well, let's just mention a few. Starting to reflect upon and invite others to reflect upon. That would be the first one. Second one would be improving communication channels, both ways that we have with our audiences and that we also have internally within our company. It's very usual that internal communications, for example, is a channel that just goes in one direction where the company tells to the employees what are the decisions that have been made. And the feedback channels are just like a mailbox for suggestions or one-on-one -on -one talks in very small environments where the focus usually is what's the performance of that individual. And besides that, they let him or let her know how that performance is. For example, if a boss asks his or her collaborator, how am I? In a say bus, for example, that could be a both way conversation. Activate it and reformulate those communication channels that we have with our public, with our customers, with our partners, with our suppliers, and within the organization in order to have an earlier feedback. Third step would be when we dimension and when we plan our year or our projects, we could do this in shorter stages. This does not mean stop dreaming big. It's not diminishing your ambition. It's, uh, those, those dreams, those visions, those 
long-term goal should still be there for you to be inspired. Let's think big, let's act small. This could be possible first steps. Well, uh, thank you, Pablo. Vinet, I wanted to ask you, you were speaking of sub plans within plans that allow us to be infected. When and where should we activate those sub plans in that development of strategic planning? Sure. So um, those sub plans should be part of the strategic planning. So once the professional associations either have refreshed their strategy plan or they have crafted their strategy plan for the first time. After they have done the major part of who, how, what, so what, those things laid out, then clearly that should say how should address the sub plans. So it should be part of the strategic planning process and it should be part of the strategy plan. And every time um, that is refreshed, it should be updated as well. So the plans that we talked about, staffing, operational, resource mobilization, communications, uh, all those plans should be part of the strategy, uh, strategic plan itself as a plan section, right from the beginning. Now that we speak about uh, uh, updating or refreshing these plans. So take planning, usually we see something as something that has to be general and timeless, but what's the right moment of updating those plans? Most bearing in mind the fastness with, with which the world is going right now. Yes, like I would just um, reinforce what Pablo also shared before, right? And I would add uh, from the strategic planning perspective is I would recommend at least one time a year when you have board um, meeting or membership meeting, looking at it and refreshing. And then the second portion of it is contextualizing how fast the environment is changing. Sometimes there are very big changes like COVID happened, right? So those things upend the plans. So that's a moment that one needs to go back and look at it even if we did it like say January of 2020. And COVID hit us big time from March and April uh, 2020. That's a time. That should be an urgent a need to look at, convene, and say, okay, this is what do we know? And then you need to kind of go back to the harnessing information. What do we know at that time? Right? What is happening? Nobody saw this coming this big. But what we saw should have should feed into the professional associations the refresh of the plan. How are we risk, risk mitigation? How is this health security issue going to affect our industry, right? So all those things should be done. And that's where the timeline comes in. And that very phenomenal big moment is becomes a priority to refresh it as often as it is needed. In normal circumstances, I would say once a year, quick look at it, every two to five years, big refresh. So those kind of keeping it as a dynamic document rather than a static document is uh, very important. And um, <clears throat> having a template, not, not a template, I mean, having a plan, it's not uh, difficult to refresh it. Creating is difficult in a normal circumstances, but in an episode or in a, in a, um, pandemic situation like we are facing now, then it is a major shift that we need to have in our strategy, right? How are we, uh, how are we protecting the industry? How are we getting the resource mobilization to mitigate the risk for the professional association itself, but also uh, for learning opportunities for the membership to address in their particular industry? Because your membership is not one monolith. Your membership would be from very small uh, community, whether it's farming or marketing or sellers to big uh, community. So there will be a different approaches to all of them. So creating those learning opportunities so they can uh, uh, mitigate the risk is very, very important and crucial. So to sum it up, the timing normally, at least once annually, very brief refresh every two to five years, deeper refresh, and depending on the context, 
um, like health security issue or other industry um, impacts from any external forces uh, should be urgent and treated as an emergency for refreshing. Uh, thank you, Vinet. I wanted to ask Pablo now, when you adapt uh, these methodologies, uh, these strategies, these agile strategies, how much do they take given that these are new the ways of doing things? Well, following that Pareto that I was previously mentioning and um, taking initial and early decisions, we can see changes in the immediateness. But if we're speaking about a culture change or changing processes, changing relations or changing ways of work that have been established for years, this for really to create an impact must, might take years. So for us not to be impatient, first steps may create early results but let's approach this agile strategy in order to reach an agile culture. This means working in an iterative and incremental way in that thing that we believe it's most important for our organization. There's companies that have a good product, but maybe what they need to improve in their agility is their internal relationships, working climate. And while they work, properly on one side, they improve their internal uh, problems, or maybe it's the other way around. They have an incredible uh, labor environment, but uh, they're not as profitable. Maybe they can focus on their profitability. But when do we reach a completely agile culture? It's as hell. It's a path. There's no promise that ensures, okay, if you go to the gym every single day in one year, you'll be healthier. Not sure. Uh, might generate early results, days, months, sure. Depending on how much energy and how much focus we give it. And that might take to reach to all the limits of organization, possibly a couple of years. Pablo, why do you consider uh, this? Agility strategy is much more convenient than using other types of strategies that are a bit more traditional. Because usually we used to be in our comfort zone and working on those topics that we know the best. But if we had to take a decision today, how to work, which would be those advantages in the strategy? Well, first of all, I think it's not, we should not demonize traditional ways of working. The way that you're working right now is the best way you found and that has allowed you to reach that point where you are right now. Based on that premise, techniques, methods, and agile mindset usually has a differential compared with more conservative type of methods, more hierarchic type of methods based on, on several aspects. First of all, we have a decentralized knowledge or knowledge shared among all of the organiza organization with a consequent decision-making that's timelier and delegated to those that have that possibility and those capacities. That would be a positive approach within a within a, a more traditionalistic type of uh, working method, more by silos. Usually uh, decisions are not being made by those that should be making decisions. So there's an advantage in terms of bureaucracy. Another huge advantage is related with return on investment. At the moment you deliver to the market early, a product or, or a service, we start having an ROI earlier, and this leads to recovering our investment faster. Or this might be that if we are following the wrong path, we'll have an earlier feedback instead of constructing a product for an year, as Vinetta said. 
instead of working for one year, 10 years in a strategy. And the moment you have those timely changes, that feedback will give us the possibility of changing the path to a better path with better times, better times of adaptation. So there's some advantages in terms of agility. Thank you, Pablo. Vineda, I wanted to ask you, when we are in an ecosystem where there's two or more organizations or associations that work on the same sector, how do we do that this, that brings us together, that this purpose, the strategies, allow us to have a joint collaboration in order to seek a growth for all the sector? Very good question. It's, it's important to uh, see if there are two different professional associations, right? That's what uh, is being considered, correct? Yeah. So if there are two different professional associations, there could be conflicted, uh, conflicting interests, right? And it's okay. It's just to have a build an understanding where common goals are and where the conflicting uh, um, uh, interests are. And then converging on the common goals and mitigating the conflict interests and keeping it separate. It can be done uh, together. It can be done together on the common interests and then diversify into your own section where there are conflict, conflicting interests. So it can be done together uh, as a major portion because of the, because of the same industry. And, uh, and it, it'll, it's interesting how those pairs would work because in the SWOT analysis, they might land up as a comp competition to each other. So that's where those fine nuances will come in. How much can the two different professional associations work together to create a single a strategy plan. For example, I want to give you an example of the uh, uh, OBGYN association I worked with as like a, a big consortium, right? So it's a, it's a body of different associations that feed into federation and then they, uh, they work together for all the associations. So there can be an approach taken as a mother association, a federation of those professional associations, and then sub associations, or they can separate with their common, uh, common goals, um, what to how developed, and then feed into where they differentiate and the competing uh, interest might play out. Did I answer your question? Well, yes, thank you, Veneta. Uh, now that we were speaking that sustainability is something that's very important, how do you think that this should be incorporated within the strategic plan of associations in order for, in order for them to be successful? That's a very hard question and then very hard way to do it. Sustainability, again, um, is very hard to foresee, what I've seen in my experience is that it's um, one, it's long-term thinking and be able to do a long-term SWOT or the predictability or the foreseeability of what is going to happen in the trade or the industry. But nevertheless, it's very important that looking at the sustainability, right? So um, innovation comes in there. Right? Let's say taking one particular industry, you see the science and innovation is working uh, forward. And how do we see five years from now, uh, the new innovative ways uh, impacting our industry and thinking how we are going to sustain uh, our trade and modernize or adapt to the, to the changing ways. So they're overlapping between how we develop our uh, strategy and sustainability of the trade. And then it reflects back to the professional association, how as a professional association we sustain. And I think one of the most important factor would be your sub plan on resource mobilization, right? So keeping your uh, professional association well resourced in not only short and medium term or the life of that particular uh, strategy plan. Let's say you made a strategy plan for two years. So strategy plan would talk about the resource mobilization uh, sub plan for two years. But then 
sustainability plan would solve more longevity, right? So that would address uh, those part of your professional association also reflecting on the trade itself, right? How do we adapt technology? How do we adapt our membership uh, to uh, adapt to the changes that are gonna happen from 10 to 15 years? So those kind of things would be important to address and it's so, so important to uh, work on the sustainability plan. And it's an it's a entity in itself. So, but keeping that in your timeline of strategy plan is also useful. It's hard to have, a, have it um, developed at the same time as a strategy. So it could be chronological. You develop your strategy plan, you have a timeline, where you put in the strategy, uh, uh, the sustainability plan within it to develop it. So that would be my recommendation. Now that we're speaking of resources, Jeanette, how do we do to commit that human resource that's key in all this process, you know, this process of the strategic plan, implementation, sustainability, growth within the, within the organization. How, how do we make them commit? That's one of the commonest questions I get when I do workshops for professional associations or when I work one-on-one -on -one as a consultant with them. And usually we overlook the human resources in that. I think that uh, to make it work, we need to have at least one staff person involved. Because the voluntary engagement from our membership or from board or otherwise larger uh, stakeholders um, is uh, maintained when there's a one dedicated person uh, convening them, keeping them together. So I think that having one, and sometimes it's, it's almost uh, very interesting to go into a group and say, oh, we don't have any staff person. And then you convene a meeting and then say, who's interested in this part of it? And then you do identify one. And then you go to the board meeting and say, who's interested in uh, helping with the strategic plan refresh or development? And you would be surprised how many come up with it. So we start often start with saying, we don't have human resources to either keep, build the strategy plan or keep it alive and refresh and dynamic. And you'll be surprised how many people jump in. So it's just creative thinking. Having one staff person, at least if the professional association is smaller, depending on the size of it. And then building it out, uh, representation from your board member, from your membership, from your customer base. So you can have a good uh, build out without investing um, uh, financial resources into it. But it's crucial, crucial to have those people identified and roles and responsibility of each one clarified to build that. And then as we grow, building that, uh, the human resource plan is building, like let's say we start with 15 membership, right? 15, we are a group of very small professional association. We start at a city level, we started. So three to four members would be good, right? One, maybe two hours a week, a staff person. And then having uh, two, three members from our uh, different sectors, stakeholders, building that and then building in strategy plan. Like, okay, our one year goal is to build our membership from 15 to 20, to go from one city to two. And then how do we match that human resource plan would keep us creative in that, right? When we expand our membership, we can say, okay, today we are uh, committing to two hours of a staff member, right? Then let's make it next year, we want to have a 20, double the membership. It could be percentage, it could be number, it could be uh, depth, it could be breadth. So according to that, you build in how much that would be, and that should feed into your uh, uh, operational budget as you do that. So they all go together. The sub plans need to, there should be a direct line, how you're growing in your strategy, how it is looking in the, in the staffing, how it is looking into operational, how it is looking into, um, into resource mobilization, you should be able to have a direct line between that and uh, from human resource to everything else. Um, so creative thinking, building out, matching what your growth plan is with other sub plans is the way to go. Well, 
Well, thank you, uh, Vineta Pablo, for your contributions. Uh, very enriching for us, associations. I believe they this uh, this share a clear message that we need to constantly work on our passion, on the growth, and not lose focus and having a strategy for us to adapt rapidly to those things that we face permanently. So thank you very much. And this will be very valuable for every single one. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura, for your, for your question asking facilitation, Pablo for co-panelists and everybody else. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you, Vineta. Same for you all. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, team. Uh, excellent session. Uh, thank you, Laura, for your uh, valuable contribution and speakers uh, for um, uh, all that information you shared with us. So to end today's agenda, we have a brief presentation led by a friend and colleague, Frat Belin Escaraman. Frat Belin has more than 15 years of experience in, in market international development, promoting food and agricultural products. He has worked with cooperators with associations of cultural products, commercial associations, and agricultural departments of the United States managing markets in the Caribbean, Central and South America. He worked for the United States Embassy in Santo Domingo, occupying several positions for the State of Department and for a USDA of the US Embassy in the DR. He creates a Strategos Consulting Group and he started working as a consultant for the US the Soybean Council being responsible of the uh, Dominican Republic and Jamaican markets. Fred, you're, well, uh, you're welcome. Uh, you're, you're, the floor is yours. And thank you, Bailey. It's a pleasure uh, for me being with you all. And um, Bailey has spoken a bit about me. Frat Belines Caraman and Scaragana have been working with the industry since 2007, industry that is of my passion. So in the United States, we have seen several things this year and current times are bringing with them very interesting challenges. I'm not going to be sharing a presentation. I'm going to be based more on comments because I have several topics that I wanted to discuss with you all not just about sustainability, but I wanted to speak a little bit about the advantage of the United States so and how that advantage, two very interesting pillars that Fineta mentioned in their presentation, sustainability and innovation. And I uh, wanted to speak about this both. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for being with us this three days. A very interesting talk we had today speaking about strategic topics and it's always a dynamic topic if we look at this from the agility scope as Pablo mentions we need to change our mindset and start giving the opportunity to certain topics that maybe within previous paradigms we were not considering and one of those topics is sustainability and the United States soybean industry for some years now, has understood that as Pablo says, that sustainability is no longer a trend, that sustainability was never a trend, and it was some that was not necessary for us as soy producers being able to have the availability of these raw materials that the animal protein industry and balanced feed needs to to subsist. So, uh, Laura, before opening this platform, was mentioned about this uh, current situation affecting us and how the industry and the industries are um, facing challenges. And us, as a United States industry, we want for our soil to be always available and how caring for our lands, those harvest lands, and that sustainability more than previously is given to the situation, well, this topic is gained a certain interest now, but sustainability nowadays for the association members that are producers, 
presents a tool that could be useful to develop competitive strategies and the United States so comes certified. We have the sustainability protocol of the United States where all the soil that we purchase comes with a sustainability certificate, but we also have a sustainability seal that you can use for those that you want within your packages from uh, the balanced uh, food package to, uh, to your final product, to that uh, swine cut or that chicken breast. So that's available in order for your customers internationally and nationally can develop new tools that will allow working, operating, becoming more efficient and capturing more market whenever you are operating. This is something that's of our interest, help you all, support you all. And actually yesterday, as a coincidence, I had this very interesting conversation with one of the largest the producing companies in the DR. We're speaking about the seal and, and, and they have shared with us because they're going for the license and they presented the story that they'll start sharing as a company and they have already identified all the sustainability elements they had in order to the conversations we've had, they've been able to identify because they asked us constantly, how do I do this? And we started the conversation, do I have um, solar panels? We do have uh, bio, uh, we have, do you, we started going over the other practices. Yeah, do you have recycled plastic? Do you have people collecting plastic? And they said, yes, yes. So they started working on this and they developed this marketing plan because you know, nowadays marketing is still its own stories. So now that they have found their story, they're going to use the seal and they're going to tell that story and they're going retail with it. That's what we want. We want for our customers to see the opportunities they are because possibilities are infinite. Everything will depend on the creativity and how marketing is directed. This is something. The other thing I want to speak of is a competitive advantage that United States Soy has. And we have documented this with our amino acid profile has better content, is more digestible. And because of this, it allows us uh, to develop better conversions for those that are using this ingredient within their formulations. We also have a support team. We also have certain tools available to calculate those values. And those uh, tools that have been developed have allowed us to give a number to that, uh, pr that profile amino acid profile that translates into savings to the customers that the United States so has to our customers. And last but not least, I want to speak of the support given by the United States industry. We're the only industry that produces soy that we just don't want to sell, we want to support, we want to help you, we want to go hand by hand with the customers. We want to develop customers that last in time. And now more than ever, we know that we need to be more present and we are completely open, collaborate with our customers that are now our friends. We, are, we have relations now, we go, we go further than a commercial relationship, but there's personal relationships with all the tools that we have are available for you to develop your products. So ladies, gentlemen, I want to thank Vinetta. I want to thank Pablo. I want to thank Laura. I want to thank Belinda. I want to thank all the USIC team that collaborated in the development of this event because virtuality Makes us a bit more agile, right, Pablo? Because maybe we don't have to be moving physically 
but this team working behind the scenes it needs to be a bit more coordinated and work it's been done and i want to thank all that team i'm speaking of the USEC team and to all those that have participated today that without you this would have not been possible so ladies gentlemen thank you very much and i hope you have a nice day